Hi everyone, my name is Travis Haymore. I'm the sales leader here at Oxide. I'm gonna walk you through a quick demo of the software. As Steve mentioned, as tangible as the hardware is and as fun as it is to talk about everything under the hood, the software is really cool as well and I wanna walk you through some of the basics of it. So in the demonstration, I'm gonna go through um, a little bit of an overview of the co-location environment, which is where we have our rack deployed. Uh, and then I'll go through some of the key concepts that are important to us around multi-tenancy, projects, virtual instances, et cetera. And then I'll actually build, deploy a VM and, uh, and use the Terraform provider as well. So, and if there's any questions along the way, please stop me. All right, make sure that my screen is still shared. Everyone's still able to see everything. Here, let me just uh, log out so you get the full experience. So uh, to give you an idea of things, this, uh, environment is running on a rack deployed in a colo and I've got a picture of it. So uh, this is deployed in the CoreSight uh, data center in Milpitas. It is very much what you'd expect in terms of uh, the promise delivered, rolled it in, I took a bunch of pictures and video and we powered it on and stood it up. And now we run it for our internal use cases but also for customer demos and also customer eval. So this is in a lot of ways uh, its own little cloud itself. And so from an administrative perspective, when we want to spin up users or customers or partners or what have you, uh, we can build out what we call a silo. And the silo is our concept of multi-tenancy. And the idea is that it is logically separated based on CPU, memory, storage. It's also cryptographically separated and it's a separate API endpoint. And so it is very much uh, dis uh, distinct between the users or the, the customers of the system. Um, and so if you were standing this up inside the UI, you would dedicate how many CPUs you want, how much memory do you want, how much storage, and then tie it to an IDP such that that silo gets stood up. Uh, the names are a, a bit trivial here because we don't wanna uh, expose customers that are using it, so it's all anonymized. But there's also the Oxide silo, and then of course there's the Sandbox silo, which is the one I'm gonna log into and show you. So this is the sandbox the, that I get to play in. Uh, it's a silo that was created for, for sales and demo environments. We've got it linked to our Google IDP, so it just uses my Google credentials when I log in. Uh, inside the silo, you'll see uh, the, uh, the concept of projects, which is a, a logical distinction of different efforts that might be happening across an organization. If you wanted to test the latest version of software in this project or stand a particular environment in that project, if you wanted to have different users with different privileges inside of those projects, those are the sorts of ideas that you would have to, to, to leverage this construct. Um, then there are images, which, which you can think of as in terms of operating systems. I've got a couple that are floating out here, but you know, the, a lot of things are out there fair game, but you've got some Debian, some RHEL, Ubuntu, there's a Windows image, et cetera. Uh, you can see how we're doing in terms of utilization. I am fine, we'll be have enough to do the demo today for sure. And then you can do some basic access control around what the users can, cannot see, what they can and cannot do inside the silo. So uh, we'll create a new project for today. Uh, So inside of our project, uh, we've got instances, disk, snapshots, images. This is again, you could have project specific images. So if you wanted to test the, the latest version of code in a particular OS and not have it propagate out to the rest of the users in the silo, you could do that here. Uh, VPCs, which is again, very much a uh, virtual private cloud in terms of the networking and self-service networking for developers. And then floating IPs for less ephemeral IP addressing and more uh, static mapping so that you can have an IP mapped to a specific resource. And then access control as well. So uh, spinning up an instance, which we call for a virtual machine, uh, the idea is that that you would have uh, a lot of this done via the API, the CLI. I'm using the UI because it's fun to follow along and see what's happening. This is a subset of the API and it's writing on top of that, but uh, it's a lot more uh, um, fun to interact with for the users. So. At the hardware layer, we can select how many vCPUs we want, how much memory we want, uh, and then uh, we've got some suggestions here out of the box around like high CPU utilization, high memory configurations, and then certainly you can customize as well. But we're just gonna get a small one here today. Uh, I've got a couple of images to choose from at the silo level, so at that parent level across the entire silo. I don't have any in the project space because I would have to upload those and we don't have time for that. So I'm gonna grab, uh, let's see, how about the Ubuntu? So we'll do the Ubuntu. And uh, we could add additional disk here if we wanted to increase size of the instance or if we've got an existing disk. Uh, and then the, 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 uh, the disk origin might be from a snapshot existing otherwise or an image. Uh, you can select your block size and sizing and so forth. But 
Um, within authentication, we are passing SSH keys via Cloud Init. Uh, this is really handy if you want to spin up an instance or many instances and you want your team to have SSH access to it immediately. This is very helpful. I've got Trevor, my. Can you, can you attach external storage to this? Yes. Yeah, so uh, I see this as a trend that's changing with uh, with a lot of the, the the Broadcom acquisition of VMware. The uh, the implementation of guest uh, attached storage via iSCSI and other means as a way to untether themselves or customers uh, to break away from that like lock in that you see, where they have deployed VMware and it's block based storage and they can't separate the two. So we think that that's going to be the path that a lot of our customers are going to see. But yes, you could do network based attached storage this at the guest layer. Uh, some advanced configuration options, if you wanted to uh, select the network interface, if you wanted to map it to a different uh, VPC, those are the sorts of things you could do there. So let me break out here, see the, the different things here. I, I don't have any VPCs built out since we just built this, uh, this project, but so we're just going to let it go to default. And there's some additional CI user information that you can pass in. So let me spin this. Um, yeah, and I mentioned this, most of the customers that we're working with today are not heavily using the UI. Most of the folks are leveraging the API, the CLI, Terraform provider, those sorts of things for standing up the instances. Uh, we do have some that are starting to use the UI for their words, not mine, less sophisticated users. So really looking forward to getting some feedback on that. And if anyone wants to play around with this, there is a mock console that you can access from the GitHub repo, and it is uh, fully equivalent in terms of everything that you see, but there's no back end. So it's really- Is there a way to operate below the VM layer? In what way? Is there an API for that, or or it just oh, it, I see. yeah yeah yeah. So at the, so if you think about it in the distinction of the the VM layer as a guest services or or uh, for the developer space, there's another idea of the operator and the yeah. things that you need to do to manage the system about managing IP pools, managing BGP connectivity, um, uh, yep. DNS, NTP, all those things. All that is API driven as well. Yeah, and it's different from a visibility perspective because you don't want your developers doing some of those or maybe all of those things, and so you have to you create that delineation between what is an operator and what is a developer and where do they live. Yeah, but you got all the APIs for that as well. Yes, it's all API driven, yeah. Um, apologies if you already mentioned it, but what is underneath? Is it like KVM or the hypervisor? Uh, so the hypervisor is based off of Beehive. It is our own derivative, uh, largely written in Rust. It's called Propolis. Okay. And it is also uh, fully accessible and public in the GitHub repo. Okay, and uh, no, like how about the containers and stuff like that? Is it? Not yet, or? So we, uh, we stop at the virtual instance layer, and this was driven largely by customer feedback. Please don't do yet another bespoke container orchestration management layer. Okay. Uh, and the <laughs> idea is that we would like to snap into others that have found value in Rancher or OpenShift or others that, that are out there. And we have made it very, very easy to do that. And foundationally, it should be very straightforward, yeah. So I, I logged into the serial here to get you an idea of like what it looks like. So this is the Ubuntu image that, that booted up. We've got serial access within the UI, which is really handy to debug systems and, and gain access to it at a low level. Um, it, again, this is all accessible via the API as well. So you could do that on your own. But um, uh, I want to back out and let's go over to a different project. So I've got uh, a Terraform project, if you will, stood up. It's, it's blank. It's just empty, no disk. No snapshots, there is one lonely image here. It's a Debian, uh, just generic cloud image. And then the default VPC that stood up. I've got a Terraform uh, script that we've put together. This is largely based off the example that's in the Terraform provider. So if you were looking for our docs or anything like that, it's very straightforward, good walkthrough of how to use it. I've got it built out um, pretty simply. I'm building up a couple of disks. Uh, a couple of instances, I'm mapping in my key, um, more or less hard coding here, so less elegant than it could be. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to bring up terminal here, let's clear that out. Yes, I want you to run. So in that, it's gonna start creating our instances and starting them up. We've got a couple of database instances, a couple of web instances. Um, oh, come on. 14 seconds. Right, my record's 12. I was hoping for a new one today. All right, so uh, on the web instance here, I signed an uh, ephemeral IP address. Uh, you can see here, we can, you can pop into it, make sure it's, yeah, it's all good. We're gonna 
copy our IP address. We'll do a new uh, rail. Yes. Entering my SSH password to access the instance. There's our Debian at web instance one that we built out with the Terraform provider. Very straightforward, nice, quick, and easy. Folks have been really happy with the responsiveness and the, the simplicity of it. Um, again, it does boot like a rocket, so people have been really thrilled with, with that. And then if, you know, um, if we needed to take snapshots or if we needed to make images from those snapshots as we create golden images, then those are things that we can do as well. We manage the images at the project level and as well as the silo level. So if we need to promote images once we've created those golden images, those are things that we can take advantage of as well. Um, and let me quickly highlight one other thing. So inside of the, um, the, the project space, we also have networking that has been created for us. And um, the, the VPC that we are tying these instances to, we have the ability to manipulate from a self-service perspective from the developer, but also the firewall rules, create additional subnets, and then route between those, which is really handy when you want to start creating the allow deny targets across, whether it be the subnet, the instance, the VPC itself, uh, and making sure that you can enable VNC access to your Windows instance and other things. So very helpful there. How fully featured are the firewall rules? Uh, they're pretty good. Uh, they've come a long way in the past three, four months. Um, uh, it's really interesting to see the, the work that's been done to, to optimize them and make them more intuitive. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got a, a networking background myself, so I think it's pretty straightforward in terms of I want to create a rule and I want to you know, create the directional flow. Is it in inbound? Is it outbound? What's my priority of that? And then what's my target type associated with it? So yeah, I think it's pretty robust and straightforward. It's very much what you find in, within a traditional VPC environment within AWS. With, with, with more, as you say, available in the API. What's that? With more available in the API. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah so the, yes, the UI is a, a subset of the API. Because this is simple. So I, I have a, high, a sort of a higher level question. Um, does the rack present itself as just one computer with a whole bunch of cores and processors? Or do you present it as a whole bunch of separate computers? I mean, how are we, you know, physically we're consuming it as a, the rack is an atomic unit. And I love that concept. But how is it logically presenting it? That is up to the operator and the customer. Okay. So we have customers that have a single silo and it's presented as one large computer like one with large all the resources. With just a bunch of cores in it. Or you can slice it however you want. Right. And so the silo concept, you say, well, I want this team to have 32 cores and that team to have 64 cores. And you know those are sort of the the idea of the silos because not everyone has multiple customers, but a lot of people have multiple departments and multiple needs for isolation and different visibility for you know privileges and security clearances and other things. So that isolation and multi tenancy is really important. So it's really up to the operator how they slice it up. What about multiple racks as a single silo? Yeah, so that's what we're working toward with multi rack, and the idea is that we'll expand the control plane across them. There are sixty four ports across the northbound connections of the rack. That's more than anyone needs in terms of one-to-one -one connectivity for the network throughput. Uh, so we see those as crosslinks and then also traversing third-party network and extending the control plane for local AZ and uh, adding that as like a single API endpoint. That's where we're working. It towards. makes the silo the unit of the foundational yeah, unit. The atomic unit. Yeah. yeah. Rather than an individual server in a box, it makes the silo the box. Can, can I have a quick one? So I have so many questions, but okay, since we're in this, I'm going to ask. So like symmetry, like between these plates, like, you know, let's say I want to expand storage or I want to expand you know, like just the memory. Like, you know, I don't, I'm running out of the memory. Like, yep. you know, how flexible am I in this rack? Yeah, so there is some flexibility with it. I mean, granted, this is the first generation, so there's uh, a little bit of consistency, but you could do half a terabyte of DRAM, you could do full terabyte of DRAM. If someone really wants to pay for 128 gig DIMMs, you know, that's a, that's a conversation we're willing to have and we need to test and validate. Yeah. The idea of different storage sizing is something yeah. that we've encountered already and it's something okay. that we need to test. It's more of a procurement exercise and a validation exercise. So can I just ex like expand purely the storage? Like, let's say I want to storage only mode, a node into, into, the, into the rack. We're getting there. So okay. the idea of a storage-centric blade, a, uh -huh. a, a different profile, a different hardware profile, hardware acceleration, yeah. those different sled types to give you better control of the, uh, uh, of the layout of the different pools, that yeah. is something that we want. Yeah, because that's, that's usually the biggest challenge with this kind of architecture, right? Like, you know, clients who wants to expand the storage, this is getting too expensive. So they just want to be allowed to expand, you know, storage when they yeah. need to only. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I feel that because when you add in that block, it's always the same ratio and so many of those different environments. Exactly. Maybe you don't need a CPUs, you don't need a memory, you just need a storage. Yeah, okay. yeah I think Turin's going to offer us that uh, different flexibility around the different core counts, different memory counts, and mm. different storage. I, I see a lot of folks doing that at the guest layer. Mm. Just because, I mean, again, I think Broadcom's going to push people in that direction the way they've done it. Um, but yeah, there's going to be the option for us to do different drive okay. types and sizes as well. Thank you. But you can access external storage if storage is your your Yeah. Line in, in yeah. yeah. Well, I'm on to an external storage array. Yeah, and I, I, that's the conversation I see. And that's that's iSCSI only, you said, or is it fiber channel as well? Do you support no fiber, fiber channel, channel off of the rack? Okay. So if so you're going into that space, you're going to do some sort of network tax element. Yeah, we're we're Sorry. trying to leave fiber channel behind. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, I'm going to destroy our uh, our instances and wrap up that. here. So um, let's watch them disappear from us. So the disk, they should be. Leaving us as well. All right, and thank you. That's it. That's that's our high level demo. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Well, uh, again, uh, a lot to take in, a lot to talk about because we are a server company and a switch company, hypervisor company, and a control plane company, and uh, it just turns out that these are all part of the absolute product when you're building a cloud computer. Um, so, wish we had a little bit more time. We can go to, to all kinds of depths in a whole bunch of this. Uh, I will just put in another plug for uh, Oxide and Friends. We have like documented all of the low-level stuff that we've gone through and gotten a lot of the team on there talking about it. We have got a lot of our documents published online, and uh, and then we always like to uh, talk about what we're building. So, if you've got additional questions that come after the fact. Uh, please let us know.